Good evening. Hello. Welcome to Sunnybrook. I'm Martha Torrey, and I'm with the Sunnybrook Board of Directors, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. September is always a month of new beginnings. Kids are back in school, and most people have returned to a different routine after the summer break. And here at Sunnybrook, we're very happy to bring an exciting lineup of lectures over the coming months. You can sign up on our mailing list or check out the Sunnybrook website for details on upcoming talks. Tonight, the discussion starts with new community options for obsessive compulsive and hoarding disorders. These conditions can impact patients in many ways. For some, seriously affecting day-to-day -day living, the ability to socialize and work and overall quality of life. Things as seemingly simple as hosting a dinner party or getting ready for work can be extremely difficult to navigate. Here at Sunnybrook's Frederick W. Thompson Anxiety Disorder Center, research and clinical services are ongoing to help patients living with these and other disorders. And we are very fortunate to have an esteemed panel of experts with us tonight to help us understand what these conditions are, why they happen, and what can be done to help. Helping us lead us through tonight's discussion is Dr. Anthony Levitt, Chief of the Brain Sciences Program. Dr. Levitt's research is focused on several related areas within the field of mood disorders. He's examined treatment parameters for seasonal depression, as well as the epidemiology of this disorder. His group has been involved in clinical trials in the long-term treatment of adolescents with depression. They have also examined new therapies for treatment-resistant depression. Dr. Levitt has a firm commitment to public and medical education and expanding access to care for people in the community. You may recognize him from some past speaker series lectures. We are in very good hands. Please help me welcome Dr. Levitt to the podium. Thank you, Martha. Uh, very good evening to everyone here on the, this campus and remotely through the webcast. So I hope everyone has had a good summer and is enjoying summer this week. Um, tonight, our lecture is about community options for obsessive compulsive and hoarding disorders, and we have a great lineup of experts. Dr. Richter is going to kick off the presentations with a talk about understanding obsessive compulsive disorder um, uh, or OCD and hoarding disorders. Uh, Dr. Marlene Tokshif will then discuss what's new in the therapies for OCD. And Dr. Lance Hawley will then present on the role of mindfulness in managing these conditions. And then, then Eliza Burroughs will talk about new, a new initiative, uh, the first of its kind, around hoarding and community outreach. So we'll set aside some time at the end for questions, and I hope we have a, a, a very vigorous uh, discussion there. Uh, there are white, small white uh, rectangular cards that have been left uh, for you on your seats. If you want to write your questions, that's the best way to do it. So we'll be having written questions. Uh, volunteers will come after each talk to get your written questions. So just put your hand up and our volunteers will grab the uh, index cards. And then what I will be doing uh, feverishly as the presenters are presenting is sorting through those cards because often what will happen is two or three people will ask the same question and we'll just combine them into one question. So if you, if you are interested in asking a question, write it down on those index cards. If you need more index cards, I guess you index, you indicate that to the volunteers as well. Um, now, feel free to get up if you need during the course of the evening. We're not taking a formal break and there are washrooms just outside the McLaughlin Auditorium and, um, and refreshments there as well. 
So now I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. So Dr. Richter is internationally renowned for her work in OCD and hoarding. And it uh, bears me in mind when I first went to New York City and went up the Empire State Building and I looked over this massive place called Manhattan with all its complexities. I thought, I really hope there is someone who understands what's going on in New York City because otherwise it's a mess. And uh, when I speak to or hear from the Dr. Richter about OCD, I feel like she's that person for OCD. She understands the condition, she understands many aspects. So it's a real treat for us to have her present on OCD and what we see. Thank you, Anthony, so much for that kind introduction. Is the sound okay at the back? Do you need a louder? It's good. Okay. Always louder, a little louder. Okay, we'll get it up there and you let me know how that works. So it's always a pleasure to see such a great turnout for an event like this. Uh, those of us in the Frederick W. Thompson Anxiety Disorder Center feel really proud of the work we do and the difference we feel we can make and it's wonderful for us to all have the opportunity to share it with all of you. I also don't want to forget by leaving too late my word of thanks for all the various people and wonderful volunteers in the community who have given up their time tonight and are sitting at tables from uh, organizations like OC Anonymous, Toronto West OCD, OCD Canada, and I believe MDAO. So I want to say thank you to all of them and I encourage you all to visit those tables as well for information. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about OCD and hoarding today. And what I'm going to do is kind of go through a description of what is OCD, what is hoarding, and a very brief introduction to treatment options because we're going to be hearing a bit more about some of the advances in treatment as the evening goes on. I would love to see a show of hands. How many here have come to one of our previous public forums in which we discussed OCD? No? Okay, so OCD? Okay, so maybe there was a significant proportion though. So some of you may have heard a little bit about this before. I was introduced to OCD by a wonderful mentor, actually, Anthony and I both shared and recently passed away. And I remember when I first heard about it from him, I thought, what is this odd, odd thing? And then as I began to learn about it, I realized that OCD's been around a long, long time using other names. So I don't know if anybody has any idea who this, what figure this actress might be depicting. Lady Macbeth, I heard a number of people say that. And for those of you who've read your Shakespeare, you may remember Shakespeare writing about Lady Macbeth, washing the blood off her hands over and over and never feeling it was gone. Now we could debate whether he meant that figuratively or literally, but many people do feel it was an early depiction in literature not that long ago now of OCD. And a number of other famous figures over the ages have described issues that they themselves contended with that sounded very much like OCD, including Charles Darwin. Anybody recognize this figure? Howard Hughes, the original Howard Hughes had severe contamination issues. And I suspect many would recognize the actor who depicted him. Leo DiCaprio, who actually talked publicly about having had mild OCD issues as a child, which so interestingly and, and uh, challengingly for him, were triggered back when he was depicting Howard Hughes again. And others, of course, have spoken about OCD publicly, and I'm not going to name them all, but I think you will recognize <laughs> Now, these are people who necessarily acknowledge having OCD, but they have been quoted as describing features that sound like OCD, okay? So I'm not saying that a certain very famous figure who would call himself leader of the free world necessarily has OCD. I'm just saying there have been quotes that suggest it, okay? So OCD is pretty ubiquitous, I think, is the point I want to make. What is it? Well, what we psychiatrists look for, the presence of obsessions and compulsions. 
what are obsessions? Obsessions are intrusive, unwanted, repetitive thoughts that typically the individual recognizes as being excessive and sometimes downright illogical or absurd, but nonetheless, they cannot push away, cannot suppress, and that causes them huge amounts of distress. They provoke anxiety. Compulsions, on the other hand, are rituals or repetitive acts that people engage, on, engage in, typically to alleviate the anxiety of the obsessions. Let me give you some examples, and I think that will become a lot more clear. So, for example, most people are probably familiar with some of the really prominent constellations of symptoms we see, like people who are washers, hand washers. And these are people who typically will have intrusive thoughts about contamination from doorknobs, from shaking hands, fears of germs, or just fears of feeling dirty, fears of making others ill because they pass on germs. And typically, the compulsions that are associated with that would be a whole lot of hand washing. So that's one example, and I'll share with you some others. Before we make the diagnosis, though, we look at how severe this is, because many people often jokingly say, oh, I've got a touch of OCD. Now, actually, I've been gradually learning from my patients and the community how insensitive that can sound to so many people who really suffer from something like this, which is horrific and wreaks havoc in people's lives. But the truth to that statement is that a little bit of this is very normal. All of us from time to time experience unwanted thoughts that don't make sense. Repeating images of something we read in the news or uh, an unpleasant scene we saw in a movie or just a bizarre thought that stuck with us. The difference is the degree. And so what we look for as clinicians is whether the symptoms are causing oops, sorry, either marked distress, wasting at least an hour of the day, or significantly interfering with that individual's ability to function. And those are the hallmarks for us of when it's beyond that normal, understandable kind of variability of things we all experience and when it's really becoming a problem. So what kinds of things can people with OCD experience? Well, it's actually hugely broad in range. And I think that's one of the first sources of confusion about OCD out in the community. Many people will mistakenly think OCD is all about people who think they've done something wrong, made mistakes, or people have germ fears and contamination issues. But in fact, obsessions can be about anything and everything. So common examples are those for example, concerns about contamination. Very commonly as well, people will have, and I apologize that it's cut off at the top there, obsessions around symmetry, the need for things to be just right or even up. And these people will typically have rituals that may look like repeating actions over and over, or they may have to do things multiples of certain times until it feels just right, or it feels like a safe number. So for example, I think I just walked up to this mic and walked back, and that was two steps, but I had a bad feeling about it. Something feels wrong or something bad's gonna happen to, my, to a loved one. I may feel, okay, well, if I can just go up and do it again and think a good thought, it'll feel better. But two and four are very even numbers. They don't feel quite right. I think I'm gonna try it again. Well, six is really a bad number uh, for a lot of people. And so I might get stuck for quite a while, just kind of doing something that to, people looking on may seem kind of puzzling, may barely be noticeable, or may be very exaggerated if I have to, in fact, retrace steps across a room, and horribly distressing for the person who's stuck doing that. Aggressive thoughts. So I think most of us can understand the thoughts of being inadvertently or accidentally responsible for harm. If I didn't set the brake properly on my car, it will hit someone. If I didn't lock my house properly, then I'll be responsible if there's a break-in. Or worse, if I didn't turn off the stove and there's a fire, of course, it will be my fault. But the most hor horrific presentation for many people with OCD are the fears that they might even deliberately do these things. That can be a little frightening for others who have trouble understanding it. People with OCD, as a rule, would never want to do these things. In fact, the reason they have OCD is they are so fearful of something terrible happening. 
they would go to the ends of the earth to prevent it. But they will then get these horrific thoughts. Maybe I will stab my husband. Well, wait a minute, I've had that one. <laughs> Are you here tonight, dude? No, nobody will tell me. But on a more serious note, and I really shouldn't, I don't want the levity to misrepresent the distress people feel. Horrific thoughts, thoughts of harming your children, your spouses, your parents, your loved ones. And typically these are people who might then engage in other kinds of rituals to cancel it out. Sexual thoughts can be even worse. And again, here the key is that they are thoughts that are intrusive and unwanted to the individual, not consistent with their religious background. So they can vary a great deal. But for example, a straight person having thoughts of a heteroerotic act, or a gay person having thoughts of a straight act, both would be repugnant. To the individual, and that's the point about OCD. Again, these are thoughts that the individual doesn't want to have that cause them distress. Religious thoughts that go against one's beliefs can be horrible. Again, interestingly, the, the interesting thing about OCD is it always finds one's weak spot, and so typically people are going to get these thoughts when that is particularly important to them. And then somatic fears, fears of having an illness or disease, and I've basically given you examples of a lot already. So that's the flavor of OCD, if that makes sense to people. There are some other facts and figures I wanted to share. OCD is common. About one in 40 people will get this problem over their lifespan. That's actually a huge number of people, which means in the city of Toronto proper, we're probably talking about 120,000 people or more at any given time very large numbers. Um, it's also considered a severe mental health condition by most people who know OCD and understand it. In fact, the World Health Organization has often listed it as the 10th leading cause of medical morbidity or illness worldwide. And part of the problem is that it's very commonly associated with other psychiatric conditions depression, other anxiety issues, and other disorders related to OCD can often plague the individual. To add to the difficulties I think associated with OCD is this is a disorder that typically starts reasonably young. It's not uncommon to start in childhood or early adolescence, and almost all cases present by the early 20s. Not everyone, but most. So this is a disorder that starts when people are still feeling their way into adulthood and making those major life transitions and will then impact on their ability to pursue the, the, the life goals they would want to, whether it's education, career, marriage, family, and others. And the course of the illness, unfortunately, is typically chronic. I've asked people to take a moment and turn off their phones if you realize if you do have a phone with you, I'm hearing a few go off and it's fine, but maybe if people would just take a moment and check their phones, that would be great. Okay. Now I want to switch tracks for a moment. They say that pictures are worth a thousand words. So these are just a few photos illustrating another common mental health problem, and that is hoarding disorder. Hoarding is particularly interesting because it wasn't even recognized as a psychiatric condition until just four short years ago when it was finally identified and criteria were put out by the American Psychiatric Association. And I've got just a number of photos of individuals I've known or I've found on the net. And I think part of what's brought it to a lot of public attention are TV shows like this one, which has been on the air. I'm not even sure, maybe five or six years now, perhaps longer already. And, you know, people often ask, you know, is that show a good thing, Dr. Richter? Is it accurate? And the answer is, like everything else in life, yes and no. It's horrible in the sense that the people at the center of each episode are pushed really inordinately hard and not in a therapeutic fashion to dramatize it. On the other hand, it's made people aware of a problem that was very often hidden. And that probably is a good thing because more people are coming forward and seeking help. So what is hoarding disorder about? We used to think it was just a form of OCD. Now we recognize that it's actually a separate condition in its own right. And the key issues here are that people with hoarding have difficulty discarding with their belongings. They might be very valuable, but they might be things that the rest of us would say are invaluable or outright garbage. So for example, 
um, a playbill from a, a, a play. A lot of us might say, oh, that was momentous. That was a big event when I went to see Hamilton. I have not seen Hamilton. And if I had seen Hamilton, that would be a big event, right? Um, for those who follow musical theater, this is the event nobody can get tickets to. Or Harry Potter, the play, right? Um, but it could also be this half-drunk water bottle, or what will be a half-drunk water bottle. Because maybe it just so happened tonight that I met in the audience a long-lost chum or patient I hadn't seen in years who was very fond of. And in my mind, I might say, you know, I'm going to hang on to the water bottle because it's going to remind me of tonight and meeting so-and-so, and I don't want to forget that I saw them again after so long. So often the reasons that people accumulate these belongings are reasons that make sense to all of us. They're just attached to too many things. So associated with the difficulty discarding is this need to save things and often huge amounts of distress if we were to talk about discarding things that results in this big accumulation of belongings that substantially compromise their using their living space for the way it's intended. And that's part of the severity criteria we would look for, just as I shared with you in OCD. Again, we have to have a benchmark to say this isn't just normal day-to-day -day clutter that a lot of people would, would identify. And then we look for distress or impairment, or this other important caveat is the ability to maintain a safe environment for themselves or others. Because I think one of the worst other features of hoarding is that people with this disorder often lag in developing insight into the problem or recognition of it. And that insight often comes five to 10 years after the accumulation is really impairing them in life. So they may still say, I think it's just fine and are unable to appreciate the chaos in which they're living in the way it compromises them. But if their environment is no longer safe, we could still make that diagnosis. So this is a disorder that we now know probably affects also around two to three percent of people over their lifetime. But unlike OCD, where we talk about it young, although hoarding issues may start young, the point at which they reach that clinical threshold typically is much older and in fact goes up with age. So the majority of people with hoarding disorder would really only identify it as interfering with their life in their 40s, 50s and beyond. Um, unfortunately, again, it is typically chronic without a treatment. And that stems the menace saying, I know it's good for nothing, but I'm keeping it until it's good for something. <laughs> now, I told was showing you a photo of my office. I took it off because I can relate very well to that, as can all of us, right? We all relate to it. It's just the degree to which the, the things and the belongings take over their life. And this is just to give you an illustration. Many of you may recall the terrible fire in a Toronto community housing building in Toronto a number of years ago on Mosley. Well, this was the balcony where it started before it started. And of course, it was a terrible fire that displaced uh, several thousand people for quite a long period of time, and many lost everything. So this is a problem that we have to think about, not just in terms of its impact on the individual, but in the way it also can affect those around them. Okay. <laughs> well, glad. I was wondering about this. Uh, this is a new one I found. So I thought, how am I going to introduce treatment options? Well, these are actually the main treatments we use for treating OCD and hoarding. We have medication therapy, and we have a specific type of talk therapy or psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not going to go into much detail about either. I just want to give you a little bit of basic information about them. And it can be a really hard thing to decide sometimes which way people ought to go. Okay, so there's my little, sorry, my headers. I forgot I had this animation on it just to make it absolutely clear. Okay, so what I want to first show you is that both treatments are effective, but you may notice a difference between them. So here, this is a large, what we call a meta-analysis, where statistically they put together the results of 86 different independent trials in over 7,000 patients, and they looked at how effective these treatments were, the probability of having a really substantial response, or at least some meaningful degree of mild improvement. 
And I think you can see that with three medications here that are very SSRIs are a class of medication I'll show you in a minute. Gamlethaxin or Effexor and clonopramine or anaphronel, they get on average about 50% of people getting at least some mild meaningful improvement, about 30% getting more robust gains. So is the glass half empty or half full, right? They do help a significant proportion, but that means 50% or so will see virtually no impact with at least the first medication that they try. By contrast, the two forms of therapy that can be separated out that we typically combine when you hear people referring cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT are just the cognitive therapy in isolation and the behavior therapy, the two components. And I think you can all see pretty obviously that there we're getting response rates of about 90%. So I think it, it clearly lit and brings you to the first question, why doesn't everybody get CBT up front? And there are a number of issues which I'm gonna come back to in just a minute. Let's talk first briefly about the medications because they are helpful to a good number of people. And although I said only 50% respond in their first trial, if people are willing to try multiple drugs, typically 70 to 80% of people will get at least some degree of benefit. That's not something to dismiss. They're also very well tolerated. And as well as working on OCD, they'll work on other mood and anxiety issues. So you'll recall I mentioned that these are commonly associated with other conditions. Very commonly people have OCD with depression. OCD with panic attacks. And as the burden of illness goes up from having multiple diagnoses, the idea of the talk therapy can be quite overwhelming. CBT is a very anxiety provoking treatment and very often the medications may become a go-to first. I also wanna point out that I've talked about their efficacy for OCD or their effectiveness, how well they work. They are actually somewhat less effective in hoarding than in OCD. And these are a list of some of the major names out there. I'm not going to read them, but I think they're probably familiar to most people. Some of the key points to keep in mind if you or a loved one is going on medication for OCD is that in general, the higher the dose, the better. OCD is rather unique and doses higher than depression aren't just somewhat helpful, but usually are needed to get a good result. And the other key point is that we have to take the drugs longer. It typically takes 10 to 12 weeks to see improvement. So very commonly people come see us and say, nothing's helped. I've tried four different drugs, but none of them were taken for more than a month or six weeks. I never have more than one to two pills a day. And while the dose will vary based on the drug, typically we're talking about three to four pills a day for most of these agents or more. And then we usually talk about people saying, on oh, the drugs longer term if they're helpful at least a year. Now, CBT, I'm not going to really speak to, except very briefly to introduce. You can also hear a little bit more about it as it applies to the other conditions. But the basic idea in cognitive behavioral therapy is a cycle that looks like that, like this. People with OCD experience their obsessions. It makes them highly anxious, highly uncomfortable, to the point of panic. And in response, if they do a ritual or compulsion, they get relief. Well, who of us would not do something that made us feel better, right? So over time, this becomes really reinforced to the point that they really can't break free. The way we target it at its most simple level in CBT is we say, we're gonna to begin to challenge the compulsions. That's where we have some control. We cannot control our thoughts. We can't stop from getting them. And we can't avoid things that trigger us every day. But if we begin to challenge the rituals, over time, the anxiety diminishes. So we do this typically in a graduated fashion, going up what we call a hierarchy from things that are relatively easy. So for someone with contamination, perhaps something like this. And usually, in fact, we break this down to 10 or 20 or more steps. This is just a very short version. We might eventually build up to something like this, a very clean washroom. But conceivably have people pushing to this point because we've all been in urgent situations where sometimes you don't have much choice, right? So this is very, very difficult. I don't want anyone to misunderstand. This therapy takes immense motivation and drive to succeed. And that's again, one of the reasons why often medications are turned to first. It takes huge work and the willingness to face that discomfort. Okay, so in summary, 
We've talked about what OCD and hoarding are, and we've talked about the fact that treatment goals here are not about cure, this is a chronic illness, but about improving things. Um, I haven't talked a great deal about this, but on our website, we have a great deal of information because one of the best first steps people can take is to become informed. We've talked about the need for higher doses and longer treatments for drug therapy to work. And we've talked about the fact that CBT should always be considered and for those who haven't visited our website, I do encourage you to check it out. We have materials on the table outside, including news about um, a public education conference that's coming up uh, late October that's open to the public, and a copy of our um, support guide for people, which is free to download. And that would all stop. Thank you. One second, what we're going to do is we're going to, if you have questions, write your questions down on a piece of paper that's been supplied to you. If you don't have the index card, put your hand up and someone will bring them to you. But write your questions out now, and when you've written your question out, put your hand up, and when our, one of our volunteers will collect them. Okay, so thanks, Peggy, for that uh, presentation and a great overview of OCD and hoarding. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Marlene Tao Schiff. Uh, uh, Dr. Schiff is a psychologist with the Frederick Thompson Anxiety Sort of Center, recently joined us, and uh, she's going to speak tonight about uh, newest upcoming treatments for OCD. Welcome, Dr. Schiff. Can I just use the regular mic? Would you want me to? If you stand away from it, you'll. Oh. All right. So um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to everyone tonight about uh, some new and upcoming or currently launched uh, treatment options for OCD. And I'm going to be focusing more on the idea of individuals that are experiencing very severe symptoms of OCD. So we might ask the question, what does severe OCD look like? And uh, Dr. Richter talked about the idea of how common uh, OCD can be. And of that 2 to 3% of the population, we know that about 20% or more are actually severely affected by symptoms of OCD. And unfortunately, these individuals are far less likely to benefit from typical outpatient delivery of CBT, which is not going to get into great detail, but just the idea of kind of weekly uh, CBT sessions that might be conducted in a group or with an individual therapist, often ranging from, say, 12 to 16 weeks. And many will also not fully respond to drug therapy. We know that when an individual has very severe OCD, their symptoms will take up uh, significant amounts of time during the day. And if you or a loved one have experienced this, you will know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Functioning can be very impacted and the rituals can become all consuming. People can talk about eight, 10, 12, every waking minute of the day it feels like it's taken up by either covert, so compulsions that people are doing that you can see, or um, internal mental rituals that people will be engaging in, which can be very um, impacting as well. Interpersonal relationships can be affected, and as we know, the family involvement may become overwhelming, and uh, by family involvement, really talking about that idea, we call it often a family accommodation, and family members can very much get pulled into uh, the compulsions, which can then really impact the entire dynamic of the family. So really, until recently, um, we would say that there really aren't um, many treatment options available for severe OCD. So we could talk about the idea of whether well, there is drug therapy and there is outpatient CBT, but might not be that effective for that specific 20% affected. <clears throat> some biological therapies, which I'm not going to speak to, but uh, Dr. Richter would be happy to answer some questions about this after. We can think of what's called RTMS or psychosurgery. Some of those options are available. Uh, some of the biological theory therapies would be seen as being more experimental. And uh, 
Yeah, generally just kind of more experimental and want something that we know of as being consistently effective. So then we can turn to the idea of residential treatment, which means individuals uh, living in a treatment center and receiving treatment for OCD. Up until very recently though, individuals that were interested in this would have had to go on to the US because nothing was available here in Canada. And we can, we know that, you know, we can imagine if we haven't been in a situation like that, needing to go to the US or anywhere far away can be overwhelming. If we're not feeling well and we're so impacted by this illness, the thought of kind of packing up and going to a foreign place can feel very overwhelming. Um, but we do know it's effective. So that gives us the motivation to want to try that kind of a treatment out and want to bring it to Canada. The foundation of these programs is really exposure and response prevention. I'm not going to get into detail about this specific intervention, but Dr. Richter touched on the idea of CBT and how we try to eliminate um, engaging, being exposed to the things that trigger our OCD, but, but resisting being able to engage in those rituals. And within these programs, there's often a number of group skills that are delivered that really support um, the ERP work that takes place. And I'm going to show you a little bit about our program. I'm going to focus on that. And um, it'll really highlight the amount of a CBT that is in a residential treatment setting. So we launched our program July 20th. Um, and up until that time, there was really no Ontario-based nor Canadian uh, residential treatment option available. And at, up until then, physicians that were aware of these US residential treatment programs, um, there, it was called the Ontario Out of Country Program, and you would be able to get funded to go to the US, but not every physician would know about it. It's not possible for every individual. And as we talk, as I mentioned, it does have um, some significant factors in terms of just going there. So uh, we launched our program. We have a, it's a residential treatment program and I can answer questions more about the specifics after, but there is also an integrated day hospital piece, which means that individuals are not living there, but come for programming Mondays through Fridays. And we call intensive outpatient spots, which means an individual can kind of gradually move through phases of treatment. For example, starting in residential, moving to day hospital, and then visiting the program three to five afternoons a week. And we really designed the program to meet the needs of individuals that otherwise would have had to travel to the US. <clears throat> How did we design this program? <clears throat> so we did what we would refer to as an environmental scan across the US, the UK and Australia, which means that we had a number of interviews with different program directors, really trying to understand what do you feel are the key ingredients that make up your program, uh, visiting programs, uh, follow-up surveys based on additional questions that we may have had. And then we really wanted to include uh, the voice of the service user. So we have the service provider in terms of people that run the programs that say, you know, this has been effective, this has been helpful, and we have research as well. But it's also really important to capture the client voice and to see well, what did you find most helpful when you were there and what do you kind of wish maybe that would have existed and given all the information that we collected we then were able to put that together and pull um, sort of the key ingredients and build a program based on best practice <clears throat> including having some consultation with the residential treatment program all leading to our soft launch which we had in july so where is our program? Um, so it's been designed in, a, in that little uh, bar on the bottom kind of covers the picture, but it's been designed in partnership with um, Bellwood Health Services. I don't know, do any of you know where Bellwood is? It was the old Donwood, a few hands. So it's really just like a hop, skip, and a jump away, uh, less than a kilometer away from this this site, so we really can think of it as like a satellite site, and it's actually quite beautiful. It has a very different feel. It's not a hospital, in the way this is a general acute care hospital. It has a very different feel. It's a residential treatment program, and it actually um, also, uh, the, the staff that's there, they provide treatment on a mostly uh, private pay basis for addictions, eating disorders, and trauma, and there's 80 beds on site. 
um, we'll have a few more pictures of it. And this building really has state-of-the-art facilities. So really nice bedrooms with private washrooms. There's really pretty lounges that they've designed, uh, rooms for programming and individual time. There's a therapeutic kitchen, which is fabulous for exposure work. If some of you can uh, connect with the idea of having like, contamination fears, um, Dr. Richter talked about aggressive obsessions. You can think about holding knives up in the kitchen if other people are around and can really use it for some wonderful treatment work. And it's a really nice and close to Sunnybrook, so it has allowed some of our staff to uh, move out there to, to run the program and then be very close in proximity and connection to our staff that also has remained in our outpatient services here. So there's a few pictures. I don't know if it really captures it, but it has a nice feel when you're there for sure. That's a lounge space at the bottom. Sorry to point this, but I don't want to mess with it. Um, over to the side, there's a really nice gym facility. And that picture there is um, the dining facility. It's really, it's really quite a nice environment. Um, just really briefly, an overview of our service elements in the program. So if you were a uh, residential client in the program, there is room and board offered seven days per week. And we have psychiatric services, including you know, very much comprehensive assessments by both psychiatry <clears throat> and psychology, social work, and OT will do assessments as well. Um, and medication will be uh, implemented and closely monitored throughout an individual's time there. We deliver both individual and group uh, CBT, uh, and I'm going to show you a sample schedule in a moment, which should sort of bring it to life a little bit more. And there's also a variety of other group programming, which includes psychoeducation, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, if any of you have heard of that, uh, mindfulness, as well as dialectical behavioral therapy skills. There is daily, nur daily nursing care, which is provided by the Bellwood staff, uh, routine medical care. Uh, key piece is the family counseling and education that is delivered uh, by Sandra Cushing, who I feel I spotted in the audience. Sandra, there you are. <laughs> and um, she's working very closely with our family members, which is fabulous. And um, unfortunately, Lisa was unwell. Lisa Ledeck is our uh, OT, and she does a really incredible uh, work with our with our clients. One of the things she does, which I just think is so great, I think she calls it her functional kitchen group, um, and our clients will go and buy groceries, which in and of itself could be an exposure if you're buying raw meat, things like that, or just going out grocery shopping, routes that you take to the grocery store, and then preparing the meal. And then everyone gets to actually uh, eat it after and it provides some nice downtime as well. Um, ensuring that everybody is able to connect, not just as individuals that have OCD, but as people, which everyone is that comes to these programs. And I think, these kinds of activities give people that opportunity to be more than um, the symptoms that brought them there, which I think is so important. And case management, of course, and discharge planning, we're just, you know, we'll just be starting to come up to that in a little bit, given our first cohort started in July. Such a key piece um, of our programming is making sure that people transition back to their community and continue to maintain their gains. This is just a really brief overview of a very rich multidisciplinary team. We have psychiatrists, with myself, a psychologist. This is just uh, the intensive program per se, a therapist, interns and practicum students, a postdoctoral fellow, OT social worker, and art therapist that comes once a week. And then through Bellwood, we have nursing and a support counselor and intake coordinator and admissions coordinator. So just to give you an overview of um, that we really paid attention to the idea that you need to have a really comprehensive team uh, to be able to carry out this kind of work successfully. Here's a sample schedule, which is probably small for some people to read, but if you look at the colors um, and you look at the blue, that really highlights the elements of the program that speak to cognitive behavioral therapy. So our day is bookended by a check-in and a check-out, which I feel is very much in the spirit of CBT, setting goals for the day, uh, checking in how that's going to go, checking out in terms of what's been accomplished, what we still want to work on. And then in the morning and afternoon, what you'll see um, in total is three and a half hours 
of exposure and response prevention every day, including on Saturdays when we run our weekend group ERP. So that's an enormous amount of exposure and response prevention work. It is hours a day and it is really tough work and it's a great deal of credit that I give to our clients um, as we, I know we push them every day <laughs> to do a lot and um, everyone has really been living up to the challenge. So it's a privilege really to be able to work with people in this kind of an environment and see how motivated they are and how much they can flourish um, with this kind of an intervention. And then in green, I think of those as our other skilled groups, which kind of support uh, the work that goes on in ERP. And we have some nice kind of fun um, things, if you will. So at the end of Tuesdays and Fridays, we have an activity with our support counselor that's from 3.30 till 7, so it's a nice chunk of time. And it's not about, it shouldn't be about the OCD at that point, although a client will tell you, um, but my OCD is a part of everything, but we're not targeting it in the same way. It's about doing things that are fun. And yes, sometimes, of course, OCD comes along for the ride, right? Um, and then there's some community walks that go on through the Bellwood community. <clears throat> just to give you a little sense of the criteria, <clears throat> and I have a slide coming up which just gives a nice um, kind of snapshot, screenshot of where you can go on our website. Uh, generally speaking, it's between 18 and 65 years of age. Um, principal diagnosis must be determined to be OCD. There is a very comprehensive process to get into our program, a client package that's filled out, a physician package that's filled out by a referring physician, a telephone screen that's completed by our intake coordinator, and the team kind of meets and puts all that together. Of course, we want to be able to judge that the individual's symptoms are very severe and impact their functioning. Nobody would want to be in a program like that unless they would need that intense level of treatment. So we want to make sure that it's a good fit. <clears throat> we have some criteria um, for treatment resistant um, OCD. So if we look at the client uh, failing to respond to at least three trials of evidence-based antidepressants, one or more augmentation agents, and at least one trial of evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy. The caveat to that is it being accessible we recognize that CBT is not accessible everywhere for sure, and CBT for OCD specialized is unfortunately even less accessible. So we take all those things into consideration. This just gives a brief snapshot. And we do really need uh, the individual to have a GPR therapist back in their community that can provide ongoing medication management and therapy. And we can um, work with that individual through phone support as our clients return back home to ensure that the work and the gains that they've made can be maintained. So that's a really important part of our discharge planning process. This did not turn out as well as I wanted it to. And I was concerned because I just took the shot with my phone and then sent it to myself and I wasn't sure it was going to be great. But all that to say, you can go to our website. It's on the Sunnybrook website. It's Frederick Thompson Anxiety Disorder Center. And you will see on the, the left side, there is a link for our intensive treatment services and you will get all the information there. So sorry about that slide, but definitely everything's there. And the little links at the bottom, um, you can actually click on them. So there's the referral process intensive treatment. You click on that and all the information that you need to fill out, get organized and send to us is live and available in fillable forms. So good question, how are we gonna know if our treatment is working? We are gonna look into a variety of outcomes. We are doing this uh, as we speak. We'll look at changes in our client symptoms from the beginning of treatment until they leave our program. Uh, weekly progress, we have some measures we give out every week and collect. We will also look at daily changes over time in their ability to tolerate the exposure exercises. We are also interviewing our clients before they leave the program to really gain their narrative in terms of what was their experience in the program, what worked, what didn't work, what might they change, what was great. Um, and we also will be gaining the family narrative of experiences within the program. So we're gonna collect all that information. So in summary, um, we feel that our program really has been designed using best practices 
and involving the voice of both service users and service providers. And our hope is that providing residential treatment in Ontario will result in better outcomes, such as enhanced discharge planning, affording significant family involvement. Uh, we have specialized staff that are running our program, and we've also incorporated a very comprehensive program evaluation plan. And that's it. And all questions now. <laughs> heard a presentation about a remarkable program and many of you may understand how remarkable it truly is and maybe we'll get to that in our discussion but uh, if you have questions regarding the residential treatment program and Marlene's presentation please write them on your index cards I have received several already excellent questions that are going to be great for our discussion so please feel free to ask questions about after that talk or, or Dr Richter's talk uh, but now uh, it's time to, uh, for our next speaker, that's Dr. Lance Hawley, who is a psychologist at the Frederick Thompson Anxiety Disorders Centre. And he's going to talk about uh, mindfulness, a, um, a repurposing of an old philosophy into a new treatment system. Uh, maybe just by a show of hands, if, has anybody here been exposed to any sort of ideas involving mindfulness or meditative practices? Fantastic. That's, uh, that's more than I thought. Very impressive. Uh, so my hope tonight is to talk a little bit about uh, more sort of the westernized version of how mindfulness might fit into these ideas that we're talking about with managing OCD. Also have a chance to maybe also um, think about what might be going on here because to be honest, this is a somewhat new area, despite the fact that, relatively speaking, these ideas have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, and we're just kind of coming full circle to, to understanding how that might be helpful. So if we think about the therapeutic context, um, often people will have a few questions about trying to understand what is it like to be uh, open and aware and approaching your experience in this mindfulness dance and how that might relate to the cycle of OCD that we've been hearing about. We'll have a chance to do a brief practice for all of you that are willing to do so. I really invite you to give it a go. It shouldn't be too painful, I promise. Also think a little bit about some of the ideas of what we um, call mechanisms. So it might be that say the effects are there, but the reason that any one person would benefit, that's a little bit still um, up for debate. So we've heard earlier of one way of defining OCD, even though it's considered a very heterogeneous condition, meaning that the presentation may look very different. It really comes down to having a very aversive experience, experiencing a thought or image that really shakes you up. Uh, it's called an egodystonic thought or image, which really means that it feels extremely out of character with the kind of person that you believe yourself to be. You can imagine if you were to experience something like that and you thought that it was very dangerous or meaningful in some way, you would do everything within your power to try to neutralize or get rid of the thought or image. And that's why rituals, again, make sense in the moment. It might not always make sense to everybody in all contexts, but anything that's really reinforcing that moves from your state of high distress to experiencing less distress, you're going to be doing more often. And uh, if you approach it that way, the symptoms aren't always as important to understand as the reason that someone might be engaging in those behaviors. Uh, so there's a lot of people that might have different opinions about how you actually define mindfulness. And uh, for better or worse, we often take the more cultural and religious kind of context out of the way that we present it to people and uh, may have some views on whether or not that's a good or bad thing. But one way of defining it is really as an intentional process. So if you might imagine, maybe even over the course of tonight's lecture, um, or even throughout the day, there's times where it's actually quite hard to pay attention. You might almost feel like you're really going through the motions, you know, an hour goes by and you're not really sure how that happened. 
So there's something there that involves the way you pay attention to the stance you take to your experience. And if you show up and pay attention, you may not always be potentially curious about what's happening. You know, it might be that it's the same kind of mundane thing you've experienced many times, or it might even be times where there's a very aversive or distressing thing that's happening to you. So the idea of showing up, purposefully paying attention, and then being curious and trying to understand it a bit better isn't all that straightforward when it comes to OCD. Um, being non-judgmental is probably a hard thing to ask for most of us in most circumstances, especially when it's a very aversive experience. So if you go by those principles, it may take a little bit of um, questioning to understand how someone could do this when you have a very aversive, distressing experience. The stance is really important. So although the practices are standardized across mindfulness interventions, the stance is really what we're getting at is that trying to become a bit more open, aware of what's going on in your mind and body, kind of having an opportunity to see things almost like you're seeing them for the first time. That's really what we're getting at. And the practices are really built around cultivating that sense of self. So if you're willing to do it, um, maybe this is something you've tried before, or if not, feel free to play along. You're of course welcome to take a pass if that doesn't feel comfortable. Um, what we could do maybe together is just a brief mindfulness practice. And often, uh, since mindfulness is meant to be experiential, this is a much easier route into getting at these ideas than you just talking and talking and talking. So usually we wanna promote uh, a stance that's nice and upright and alert, so you don't have to be really fixed and rigid, but you might wanna just kind of straighten up a little bit in your chair. You might even kind of scoot forward a little bit so you're not resting directly against the back. If you're able to, you might choose to close your eyes to really immerse yourself in what's going on. The idea is to just take a few moments to kind of check in with what's going on in your mind, in your body, you're not really trying to evaluate or fix things. You really just want to take stock of whatever's present. Just allowing yourself to focus in on whatever's here. Hopefully just having a chance to be open to whatever you happen to notice. We're not trying to change our breathing, just letting the breath breathe itself. Just allowing yourself to focus on whatever's present. Focusing on the nose, the throat, the lungs. Just noticing each in-breath and out-breath. As you gather in your attention, you might notice the qualities of the breath. Breath might be fast or slow, shallow or deep. All of that is okay. You're not trying to breathe in any particular way. Just really follow the breath. Bring your full awareness to the breath as it enters and leave. Just letting the breath breathe itself. And each time your mind wanders, which is completely normal, just noticing where your mind has wandered off to and gently redirecting back to your breath, using the breath as an anchor. It's almost like you'd be noticing uh, as if you're watching a tennis match, you're gonna be going back and forth, drawn out from some thoughts, some image, some musing. Completely fine, but each time you notice it, just make a decision to come back to your breath and body. As you notice your body, you might be aware of sensations. You might be noticing your feet on the floor. You might be noticing the feeling of sitting. You might notice your posture. You might even notice the subtle movement of your body with each breath. Again, you're not trying to change your experience, just drawing your full attention to any sensations that are present in the body. And as we close the practice, waking up to the room, and at your own pace, you may choose to open your eyes. So that's it. That's about as complicated as it gets. Um, one of the interesting things about this kind of experience is that everyone probably had a different reaction. Some people may have found it boring, others interesting. Some people may have found it relaxing and irritating. There's a whole range of different responses to this. Um, but one thing I really want to emphasize is that mindfulness isn't really about achieving any particular state. It's not actually that the goal is to relax, although sometimes it can be relaxing. But when you're doing something like this, you can see how the stance is really important because you just took a few brief moments. Maybe there wasn't much context of what we were doing or why, but you were trying to approach your experience in a slightly different way than might normally happen over the course of a busy day. 
So the way we think this may fit in with OCD is that even just right now in tonight's practice, you know, maybe that wasn't the most straightforward thing you've ever done. But would it be interesting if someone had an option when they're experiencing something that feels really out of character, really distressing? So this is really meant to emphasize the idea that even if this cycle is going on and maybe we don't have control of the triggers for these events, maybe don't necessarily always know the whys and wherefores, I present an interesting option if we're able to relate to an experience even as distressing as OCD and this kind of same mindful way. Maybe something interesting could come out of it. Maybe we might learn something of value about ourselves. So a lot of options that might happen if we start to slow things down and pay attention in this way. So this probably feels about equivalent to trying to be mindful as an alarm is going off. And if you've ever been in a building, we had a fire alarm earlier today, but probably the last thing in the world you would want to do as alarms are going off is to slow down, pay attention, be curious. You know, alarms usually mean one thing is that it's not really a safe environment and you should leave, right? Um, so you can imagine, I know it's not exactly the same as what people experience, but sometimes it almost feels like alarms are going off with OCD. It might feel that we have to really do something and fix an alarming thought or an experience we have. And the idea of asking someone to sit with that, to pay attention, to be curious, and especially to be non-judgmental, often takes a bit of, uh, kind of putting the pieces together. But something interesting can emerge if you take that approach. It may not be that we necessarily like our experience in that moment, but if we're able to orient towards it, sometimes we can learn something about our abilities to, to hold that, to be able to work with it. Maybe we're a bit more resilient than what the OCD would suggest. Maybe there's even some options there about how we want to choose to respond to the OCD. So even though we don't necessarily, um, like anyone on the planet, we wouldn't necessarily like to be triggered in, in a moment of distress, wouldn't it be nice if we could slow things down and maybe consider some of the options how we choose to respond versus often people will feel very compelled, almost like they're doing things without a, a conscious decision. So that's the hope. Um, as I mentioned, when a researcher such as myself is looking, or looking at this, um, it's not entirely clear why it may be therapeutic. We, we're starting to see that the effects are definitely there. Um, as with all of our services here at the Thompson Center, we only offer really best practice interventions that we have evidence would uh, be therapeutic, but the reason that this is therapeutic is not entirely clear. There's something there about a conscious decision to orient towards what's happening, so that's called experiential awareness, using your full senses to understand. There's something there about the way we pay attention. Often, we have a very limited attention span, especially if you're like me. You know, you might be attending to a lot of various things and missing other things. There's something there about the act of looking at something observing it and then coming back that has to do with attention. There's this idea called decentering, which is really what you experience here tonight, is that you have a chance to become kind of this languaging around stepping back. And sometimes it almost feels like there's a little bit of space between your experience and that thing that you're observing. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could treat these distressing thoughts and experiences as something that maybe another event that we could actually take a look at, see what's going on, and maybe have a little bit of space between our own experience and that thing that's happening to us. Often people will notice the urge to ritualize as opposed to finding themselves engaging in a ritual. And then that's kind of an interesting spot where you can maybe, if you've ever had like an itch that you want to scratch or some other experience, maybe there's a difference between I notice that thing as it's happening and I'm make a decision how I want to respond. Not in all cases, but in some that can actually lead us to be thinking differently about ourselves and others. Maybe we're a little bit more compassionate with ourselves and we cut ourselves a break rather than beating ourselves up mercilessly for the things that we're doing. So this first piece around experiential awareness, that's just really another way of saying bring your full senses to bear on the things that are happening to you. When you're taking a shower, take a shower and be there. When you're eating a meal, be present. When you're having an intriguing conversation with someone you care for, bring your full attention to that. I mean, this is often a hard thing to ask as we're multitasking, we're doing a wide variety of things at once. Like anybody ever had one of those breakfasts where you're reading the news, trying to talk to someone, organizing some little people as they get out the door, juggling about 20 things at once. So it's not always an easy thing to actually be fully present. But even some of our earlier examples with our program is we'll just be asking people to do that around something relatively mundane. Be fully present when you brush your teeth. Try to slow down a meal and actually taste what you're eating than what we normally would do. As I mentioned, there's something interesting that happens with our attention. Um, all of us do this thing called mood congruent processing, and that's not really necessary to use that term. 
But if you're feeling angry, you're going to remember every person that's wronged you or cut you off in traffic. If you're feeling anxious, you're going to remember every event that's happening, the racism, whatever. So there's something there about the way we orient towards experiences, and it's very congruent with our mood, meaning that the mood is really telling us an important piece of what's going on. So with mindfulness, sometimes we'll see people be able to attend differently to things, maybe even making a conscious decision to notice and come back. And this is a process that can happen possibly 10, 20, 30 times over the course of a brief practice. And it might even feel like you're kind of, um, there's one analogy of like having a golden retriever puppy and then the puppy runs off and you pull it back and then it runs off and you pull it back. So we always have these kinds of um, minds that are just going after a lot of different topics. So there's something intentional about, I can notice that happening and I can make a choice to come out my breath, my body, my mind is in anger. If that happens a thousand times, that's not actually a marker of success in any way. But there is something different about the way we attend when we're being mindful as opposed to what normally would happen. Um, so in this example, maybe everyone's had that moment that I lock the door, that I bring my keys, my wallet, purse, what have you. There might be a moment where it's like, that's upsetting, what am I going to do about it? We've even had people that have this concern where they actually turn around and fully from you know, they'll be driving their car and they were 10, 20 minutes into the drive and they turn around and check the door just to make sure. This is a really difficult cycle because this can happen many times. So there's something really interesting there was like, I can hear the OCD and I can pay attention to it and I can see what it's telling me. I can still notice and come back. And that may need to happen a lot of times, but you can imagine that that would in itself interrupt the OCD cycle. We're often really proud of our frontal lobes. You know, we're humans and we think and we analyze and there's a lot of value to that, but there's something also that might be kind of like considering the costs and benefits of always being in that very evaluative analytical frame of mind. We're here in a clinical research setting, so there's obviously value in analysis. But when it comes to this observing stance, there's a difference between stepping back, almost like you would view your experience, like sometimes we use metaphors like noticing a thought as if it was projected on the screen or noticing clouds as they drift by, or noticing an experience and actually observing it, almost like you're seeing it for the first time. So this idea of decentering might be interesting if, say, you or I or someone else who may be like, very harmless and relatively safe and never has uh, any sort of experiences where they become violent, if you have a really violent image that shakes you up, wouldn't it be interesting if you could see that, kind of hear the OCD talking and doing its thing, and then still come back maybe even make a decision about what's really happening there. I mean, thoughts are often very quick, excuse me, they're often really hard to nail down, but sometimes you could actually view a thought as if it's an event, which just kind of gives you, again, a little bit of space between what the thought is telling you and what you might decide to do as a result. Um, this analogy may or may not be helpful, but sometimes people consider it almost like as if you're riding a wave, I'm not a surfer by any stretch, but if you can imagine those waves of anxiety, you might be in a relaxed state and you get triggered and then the anxiety comes and eventually comes down and maybe it comes up again, who knows. But sometimes the, the thing that we're trying to do is try to survive through those moments where the anxiety is really intense. And they consider this idea they call, they call urge surfing. I might have a very strong urge when I'm distressed to do something that makes me feel safe. Maybe I can actually tolerate that for a few moments longer and do something else that I would normally do in order to feel safe. Um, as the example, maybe I could have just that very strong urge to wish, like wash my hands, try to breathe into it, stay with it a bit longer, and then see whether or not that subsides over time. Uh, it's, it's a very different thing to try to accept your circumstances and orient towards them and maybe learn something of value versus being complacent and enjoying what's happening to you. And acceptance can kind of be a, a strange term that way. Acceptance doesn't imply that you like what's happening. But there's some dangers of not accepting your circumstances. And a lot of times the suffering that results from not wanting to think or feel or taste or whatever else can actually be pretty daunting. So there's a lot of this language around trying to orient and maybe having this observer's mind, trying to accept what's happening, again, not necessarily liking it, and then trying to see what happens as a result. Um, so there's a few uh, ideas there, like there's a difference between looking and observing or tasting versus swallowing or a lot of the things that we do. But if you might imagine trying to accept what's happening, especially if it's a distressing experience, we might learn something of value. Um, I have had people who are just their worst enemy. You know, they're very uh, critical and judgmental themselves, very frustrated about their 
experience, frustrated that the OCD is still there despite their best efforts. And it's an interesting thing to maybe kind of look at the OCD in this way because for whatever reason, sometimes people actually cut themselves a bit of a break. Maybe you're a bit more compassionate about these things that are happening and once we understand them a bit better, maybe it's not seen entirely as a personal fault. Who knows? But um, in some cases, there's something different about the shift. You know, rather than beating yourself up mercilessly, maybe there's another option. And I just want to mention uh, one of the studies that had just recently been completed. So since we're uh, scientist practitioners, we want to make sure that what we're offering is really effective. And there's a really good signal there in terms of the way that mindfulness may be having a positive impact on managing OCD. The numbers and the bars don't really matter all that much, but when we see people's um, what's called Y-box symptoms, so that's a measure of OCD, we can see some pretty significant improvement for people who are willing to do this work. There's always caveats like any other thing that's important in your life. The more time and effort you put into it, the better the results. But the people who really try to make this shift, do the work, and try these practices, we've seen some pretty significant improvements in symptoms. And last thing before we um, move on, I just want to mention one study that we're currently conducting. Um, it's a, it can sometimes be a barrier, as you might imagine, coming to Sunny Brook and or trying to go through um, various processes to um, engage in services. So we thought it might be an interesting option to provide a more kind of approachable at-home version of mindfulness. Uh, so this current study is looking at uh, whether or not people might benefit from home practice using a wireless EEG device that uh, helps you monitor. It's not maybe like absolutely authentic Buddhist principles for it comes to my test, to be honest. But if you can imagine something that's a bit more approachable, you know, that might actually help you to get into the practices, we're really hoping to see some uh, positive effects. So if you're interested, my uh, email is up there as well as on the website. Thank you very much. Very much, Lance. So, if you have any questions regarding mindfulness or what Lance just spoke about, all the previous two uh, talks, sometimes what happens is as you get more information, it brings questions back from before. Please write them out on your index card. I have received a number of outstanding, uh, we're going to have a great discussion, so I got some great questions, so please send some more. Um, our uh, next final speaker this evening is Eliza Burrows. Eliza is a registered psychotherapist in the Frederick Thompson Anxiety Disorder Centre and we'll be discussing uh, Buried in Treasure, a first in community outreach. Um, I'm just going to suggest if you feel like it, you can just standing up for a minute and giving yourself a stretch because you've all been sitting for quite a while. Um, as how high so it's, it feels good to to stand up. I know the mindfulness was really helpful. Um, and I'll just give me a second to orient myself. So you can stay standing the whole time uh, or, or sit down whenever you feel like it. <laughs> um, so unlike my colleagues, I do have some cheat sheet notes for myself uh, just so I don't forget anything I want to say. Um, so I'll just get started. I'm really honored to be here uh, with my amazing colleagues um, and really excited to tell you about this new uh, project that uh, we at the Thompson Center have been involved in. Um, as you know, I think one of our main areas of uh, treatment and research is in hoarding disorder. Um, and uh, so we've been involved in a community initiative uh, trying to address some of the complexities that are involved to treating that, that disorder. So first, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, Dr. Richter mentioned, and I would agree, that uh, hoarding disorder is actually incredibly common. The prevalence rates uh, range from about 2 to 6% of the population, so that's a lot of people. Um, that upper number, the 6%, uh, seems to uh, reflect that. It, uh, increases substantially with age. So uh, over the age of 55, we see that rate go up to about 6.2% of the population. Um, 
when clutter becomes significant, it causes significant problems. So for the person with, uh, who does hoard, for their family, for neighbors, for landlords, for city services, um, some of these problems can be uh, increased risk of falls in the home, um, infestation, uh, air quality issues, so mold, dust, uh, in some cases risk of avalanche in the home, so big piles falling over, um, causing injury, risk of fires, impediments to self-care, uh, so people can be uh, can can find it um, find themselves unable to access their bathtub or their stove uh, or be able to sleep in their bed or wash their dishes. Um, so there's also a significant uh, social and economic burden. Um, individuals can lose work days, uh, organizations can lose productivity, uh, city and social services as well as landlords uh, can end up spending substantial amounts of money. Uh, addressing the issues that come up. Um, I don't have the figures for the city of Toronto, but in uh, in San Francisco, which is an area where there's been a lot of work done in the area, they estimate um, spending about $6 million a year um, on just dealing with issues that arise um, from, from issues with hoarding. So that's, um, uh, for example, uh, emergency services, so fire services, paramedics coming out, uh, extreme cleanouts, getting rid of uh, people's items, uh, building repairs, etc. So, um, as Dr. Richter explained, medication treatments uh, may be helpful for some, but they do seem to be of limited benefit. Um, and so cognitive behavior therapy, as, as I've been mentioned a few times tonight, um, does seem to be the standard practice, uh, certainly in terms of psychological treatments for hoarding. Um, however, CBT can be costly. Um, and somewhat limited. Um, so very, very briefly, I know it's been mentioned several times, sorry, several times this evening. Um, CBT is based on the idea that the way we think and feel and behave are all mutually influencing each other at any given moment. Um, so the way we think about something is gonna affect how we feel and then what we do, what we do is gonna affect uh, how we're thinking about it and, uh, and how we feel. Um, so in CBT strategies are used uh, to explore these cycles and these kind of patterns um, and then hopefully to find more helpful um, patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving. And I'll just do it very quickly, uh, give you a personal uh, and hoarding related example. So although I'm not don't necessarily have a problem with, uh, with hoarding myself. Um, I think all of us can relate to a certain extent to the kind of the thoughts and feelings and uh, behaviors that might show up. So for example, I have a seven-year-old son who has been bringing home arts and crafts projects for about six years now. He's been at daycare and then now he's in grade two. Um, so, you know, the, the collection is growing and as of yet, we really have yet to get rid of any of it. Because when I look at any one item, I think, oh my goodness, you know, it, it's special and unique in its own way and it reflects what a wonderful little guy he is. Um, and yet, uh, although it's only been about six years, you know, they certainly could probably cover the space of this, this stage up here. Uh, so if I keep it up, uh, we're gonna need a room dead, you know, dedicated just to his arts and crafts projects by the time he gets out of high school. Um, so when looking at any one individual item of his, I think, you know, it's so wonderful. Um, I can't get rid of that. It, his feelings would be crushed. Um, you know, what would that say about me? I'd be such a bad mom. Um, and then of course I start to feel guilty and maybe even perhaps a little sad that, you know, his childhood is, you know, he's, he's growing older and, uh, and, and I would be a bad mom. And so my behavior uh, to avoid that guilt and that sadness would be to just put the piece of art back in the pile and I feel better. I've kind of avoided that, that negative feeling. And so although entirely understandable that kind of cycle in that moment, and I suspect a lot of you can relate, um, it may not be helpful in the long run because I simply don't have the space to accumulate that much art, let alone all the other stuff that, that, that he's doing and we're doing. So in that moment, I had thoughts and feelings and be behaviors, excuse me, in relation to that one piece of art. Um, and so again, in CBT, we kind of try to target or explore those things, increase our awareness of what's going on in those moments, um, and hopefully find some more helpful ways of dealing with, uh, with thoughts and feelings that become problematic. So common practice, as I said, and I think Dr. Richard said, uh, for CBT is, uh, sorry, for hoarding is CBT. 
Um, and so we know that, um, uh, I believe as Dr. Richter also said, that originally the CBT for hoarding was kind of just putting OCD CBT onto hoarding. Um, and it didn't seem actually that effective. So we were using the same strategies that we would use for OCD and applying it to hoarding. And it didn't seem to be all that helpful. So um, it looks now that it really is important to target these three things, acquiring, so the, the bringing of stuff in, uh, discarding, so the, the getting things out, uh, and that clutter, that accumulation, that disorganization of all of our stuff. CBT typically includes uh, these several of these components, so psychoeducation, giving people information about the condition, uh, why it manifests, how it manifests, uh, giving people information about potential or putative causes, um, giving information to people about um, theories as to why we think the particular model of treatment might, might uh, work and the strategies might work. Um, in CBT for hoarding, we also uh, do a lot of skills training, which you may not see with the other uh, conditions. So skills training around organizational strategies, uh, problem solving and decision making. Um, and we also do those behavioral exposures that uh, both uh, all of my colleagues have talked about. Um, so um, exposing oneself to some to an unpleasant experience, really. So it could be uh, the thought of getting rid of one of those pieces of art um, would be unpleasant. And so, um, you know, and then going through the process of maybe feeling that anxiety, feeling that, uh, that guilt and getting rid of it anyway, perhaps, although I have yet to do so. Um, and, uh, and kind of seeing what happens and can I survive? Um, and then exposures, so exposures would be about discarding and also about not acquiring. So perhaps going by garage sales if they tend to be my weak spot for acquiring or going um, to winners or Dollarama or something like that um, and, and practicing not acquiring things or going through hospitals and not collecting pamphlets. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty common one as well. Um, we also, um, down there at the bottom, which is a bit cut off, we also uh, target the C in CBT, the cognitions, uh, which are just thoughts uh, to address those hoarding beliefs. Um, and again, perhaps think of, uh, come up with more helpful ways of thinking about things. For example, that thought around being a bad mom. Maybe I, I can be a good mom and not collect every piece of, of art. Um, so we do uh, know, for the most part now, that CBT for hoarding, that the hoarding specific CBT um, is uh, effective. However, um, there are some limitations. So it's lengthy. Um, CBT is typically time limited and it is also for uh, hoarding, but it does tend to be longer than a lot of the other protocols. So I think uh, someone mentioned it. CBT for OCD is often 12 to 16 sessions. For hoarding, it's often going to be about 20 or more sessions. Um, so that means that people are um, staying in the treatment longer, which means that uh, you know professionals are having to, to provide that treatment longer, which means that more people, sorry, less people are coming in uh, and getting the treatment, which means the wait list is growing as we continue to you know, do that one uh, intervention with one person or one group. Um, it also means that we're having to pay the salaries of the professionals uh, to provide the, um, the service. The uh, number of professionals that are trained in holding specific intervention uh, are very, very few. Um, there are less than a handful in Toronto, as far as we know, and the Thompson Center um, is uh, one of the only, if not the only, uh, center that we know of that is actually providing evidence-based treatment uh, for, for hoarding. So not only is it going to be resource heavy um, for institutions like a hospital to, to provide CBT, um, but it's also going to be costly for individuals who want to seek the treatment if they can't get it in an OHIP deli delivery service. So there might be uh, private practice professionals who are trained in the intervention, um, but their fees may be prohibited for a lot of people in the community with limited income. So enter Buried in Treasures. Um, so Buried in Treasures at face value is a, is a self-help book. Uh, self-help books are incredibly common in the area of mental health. Uh, there are self-help books for OCD, for depression, social anxiety, etc. 
the Buried in Treasures uh, workbook was developed by really incredible uh, leading edge uh, experts uh, in the States, uh, David Tolan, Randy Frost, and Gail Steckity. Um, they developed the book and then along with uh, Lee Schuer, who's a professional peer facilitator uh, with lived experience uh, reporting, developed also then a companion facilitator's guide, uh, which is an excellent, excellent resource uh, to go along with the book. So that people wanting to then facilitate uh, a group using Buried and Treasures can do so with the, uh, with the company uh, manual. So the Buried and Treasures model, the Buried and Treasures program, I'm gonna start calling it BIT for short for the rest of the talk, uh, combines these uh, effective CBT principles and strategies with peer support. Uh, some people call it bibliotherapy or, or book therapy, also kind of known as a, as a therapeutic book club. Um, the uh, program is a facilitated support group that differs quite significantly, I think, from typical peer support groups in that it is highly structured and time limited. Uh, so as you can see, it runs for 15 sessions, which is spread out over 20 weeks. Each session corresponds to a chapter in the book. Uh, sessions are facilitated uh, ultimately, not always, uh, by a non-professional or a, a peer, peer support facilitator uh, with lived experience of 40, or perhaps even just have a special interest in it. Activities that happen in the group include uh, discussion of the chapters, so people will uh, read a chapter and then come back and discuss what they've read, um, doing exercises from the book, dealing with those key components, the acquisition, discarding, and disorganization. Um, and so ultimately, the goal of the Buried and Treasures uh, model and program is to uh, build capacity. And so we start to see now how combining um, the, the CBT with this really effective, uh, very helpful self-help book can start to address some of the limitations that I talked about um, in more formal and typical uh, provided CBT. Um, so, I mean, let's face it, healthcare providers are limited resources. Uh, peer facilitators or lay people can be trained in this approach. Um, and so then there are going to be more people able to do this work. Um, we also, in our program, have trained uh, housing staff and social service agencies um, in issues related to voting, so including causes, including the model of CPT that we apply. Um, it is a less kind of formal CBT approach, which may be more appealing to a lot of people, um, so that uh, participation in a program like EIT, as opposed to coming to a hospital for a more formal CBT approach, may be, again, more appealing. It might feel like there's a little bit less of a demand, a little bit less of a, of a commitment, and therefore less of a barrier to engaging in the process. Um, also, it might be, um, you can't see at the bottom there, the tip of a phase care approach. So someone might end up needing a much more formal uh, CBT approach with a, with a professional, um, but having participated in the BIT model might make that a, a lot more palpable and doable for them. So just a few words on peer support. Um, peer support is this idea of people providing knowledge, uh, experience, emotional, social and practical help to each other. Um, a peer support facilitator is willing to share their experience, um, which is uh, normalizing, validating, and encourages other people to do the same. And I think this is a really important piece uh, when it comes to hoarding, when we consider the shame and stigma that a lot of people experience. Um, and I do think that peer facilitators perhaps are in a position to do that in a way that um, professional mental health providers are not. Uh, there are peer support training programs, so not everyone, you know, is, is able to kind of jump in and do this this work. Um, and so there are there are programs, for example, the MDAO in Toronto. Um, it can take time to identify someone who is willing and able, uh, if they are willing and interested. So this would be a peer support facilitator. If they are interested, um, they may start to. Uh, join in the process by observing and then, and then the next cycle kind of co-facilitating a group with a uh, professional. 
So we have recently uh, formed a partnership with um, the Thompson Centre, uh, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation, and um, a subset of the partnership is with uh, social service agencies in the city. Um, we were uh, awarded a direct uh, funding award via the Toronto Community Housing Corporation um, as part of the Mayor's Task Force um, to help fund an 18-month expansion project uh, to, to start to roll this out. We've been meeting, um, identifying the needs of specific Toronto Community Housing buildings, uh, determining who would be doing what in that partnership. So Thompson Center staff do training, do some of the facilitating of the groups. Um, the Toronto Community Housing staff would be identifying individuals who uh, might have the need and the interest, because those two things are important, not just the need. Um, we'll be monitoring progress, and at the end, we'll be um, assessing the outcomes, the feasibility, and the acceptability of the intervention. So I'm just going to quickly go through that. Um, so far, what the research is telling us is we don't have much to say uh, so far about what we've been doing because it's really early days. But we know that um, all the people in the uh, states, all of those researchers and um, people kind of on the cutting edge who have been doing this have been studying uh, direct um, groups doing uh, professionally led CBT with this group uh, BIT model. And it's incredibly humbling to stand up here and say as a mental health clinician who has had a fair bit of training, um, the outcomes are actually the same. So peer support facilitated um, groups get the same kind of outcomes in this model anyway, uh, as those led by trained professionals. Um, and some of the research is actually indicating that perhaps those peer support facilitated groups might be doing a little bit better. Uh, so it's humbling and yet it's, it's quite wonderful. Um, so the outcomes are effective and probably incredibly cost effective as well. So really reducing the, the barriers in terms of funds. Currently we're in very early days. Uh, we've done one pilot group with four people completed. Currently we're running two groups uh, in the community. Um, at two different Toronto community housing buildings. Um, and uh, this is a really busy slide, but it's really this idea of that kind of, I told two friends and they told two friends and they told two friends, et cetera. And so it just grows and grows and grows. Um, and so by the end of this 18 month cycle, um, these are kind of estimates, um, but ideally what we hope to see is about 60 to 100 participants will have completed uh, a group for hoarding. There will have been set, uh, 11 new staff trained who can now be running these groups and five new peer facilitators who can now be running these groups. If we extrapolate those numbers, one more cycle, so that diagram on the previous slide would grow to kind of double the, those numbers, uh, that would be 100 new people in addition to these uh, clients or tenants having completed the treatment and five additional new peer support facilitators ready to, to do the work. Um, so we're going to continue with this current 18-month expansion project. We're going to be evaluating the outcomes, um, the feasibility and acceptability, and hopefully we're going to start to include uh, research that's going to help us understand a little bit more about what are some of the characteristics that really make for a good peer support facilitator. And that's the end. That concludes the speaking uh, part of the evening. We now have a chance to respond to questions and volunteers are still uh, circulating. And if you have questions that arise from the comments that are being made here, please uh, write them out and they'll still be brought to me. I have a, a great list of questions here. We're gonna work our way through them. Uh, I can't promise you that we'll answer all your questions. And I'm gonna take slight editorial uh, liberty to uh, combine some questions. So you might have written something specifically because it's related to someone, something someone else has asked, I'll put the two together. Okay, so the first question I would like to start with is, uh, what is CBT? Now, I don't expect a, uh, another hour lecture, 
But uh, what happens during CBT? What happens at the course of CBT? What can we expect? Uh, sorry if we didn't find our acronyms particularly well. Uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy involves uh, basically starting with the, the main uh, formulation that we talked about, where when we're feeling triggered, there's going to be changes in our body and our mind, and we're trying to give someone, uh, empower people to have a set of skills to intervene when they're experiencing distress. We'll often talk about the role of self-monitoring and understanding your experience, There'll be cognitive strategies in terms of trying to understand the OCD processes and have a chance to speak back to the OCD. And there's often behavioral uh, exposures, meaning that you'll be going into situations that are graded at your own pace, gradually increasing the anxiety and being able to tolerate that experience, but at the same time reducing and eliminating the rituals. So there's a lot there that we're trying to capture in a small amount of time. But the main element is that it's a very skills-based approach where we want to empower people to be able to intervene on their own terms. Okay, so you made a comment which said that, um, I think it was Bali, that um, there's a difference between a CBT therapist who has experienced OCD, OCD and, a, and a therapist who may not have had experience. In other words, uh, there are a limited number of people, uh, CBT therapists, there's even a greater limited number of CBT therapists who have experience with OCD. What is the difference between a CBT therapist and a CBT therapist that has experienced OCD? Yes. 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 Okay, so um, what I would say is, without getting into all the specifics, uh, OCD presents in a very unique way when we think about um, Dr. Holly kind of refers to the idea of the cognitive strategies that we would use. So we want to examine the thoughts that individuals have when doing any kind of CBT work. But when we think about an individual that has obsessive thoughts, and as Dr. Richter mentioned, we all have obsessive thoughts. So they're very normal. Um, there, you know, if we think about a thought, an obsessive thought such as, oh, if I touch this doorknob, I might contaminate myself with germs. That's potentially true because probably a lot of people have touched that doorknob. So we want to challenge thoughts uh, when we work with any kind of anxiety disorder or depression. We want to look at the thought itself, see if there's other perspectives we can take on that thought. But with OCD specifically, we're not going to necessarily challenge the obsessive thought because there's some truth to a thought that if I touch a doorknob, then I might contaminate myself. We want to look at how people are interpreting that thought, what that thought means to people, and we need to go to look at, we need to look at their thoughts about their thoughts in a nutshell. And um, OCD presents in a unique way, and not all therapists would know to look at the thoughts in that way and to look at their, it, they call them an appraisal of the thought. So it's a thought about the thought. And you need someone that's worked with OCD, not just for that reason, but to really understand um, the way that OCD presents. It has many layers to it often, and it's a very um, non uniform uh, type of illness. And you really want someone that's had experience and good training in that to be able to tackle it properly. Just one little added comment yeah. is that, unfortunately, while there are lots of excellent mental health professionals in the community who've been trained in CBT, the number who are trained in CBT for OCDM there is really quite small. And what we do know is that general CBT, which can target mood and anxiety very beautifully, doesn't work well for OCD. And so what happens is people will come to us and say, CBT didn't work for me, when in fact they've never had CBT that was really effectively targeting the OCD. So that's, that's kind of why we make comments like that. It is very important if you're seeing someone to feel comfortable enough to openly ask them, have you had training in working with OCD? How many OCD clients have you worked with? And that's perfectly reasonable and fair. 
Okay, thank you. Excellent answers. Uh, I, I must have had now a half a dozen questions asking this, uh, comments asking the same question in a variety of different ways. But essentially, what does one do if one's living with a person who's a hoarder, who refuses to admit it, and isn't willing to do anything about it? It, it, it's a very tough one, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a, a an easy answer for you. And I, I think Dr. Richard might want to add to this. Um, the well, I'm not I don't remember Dr. Richard's talk, but one of the um, pieces of a diagnosis for hoarding that we don't necessarily see with other uh, disorders is um, this piece around um, whether or not the issue is creating uh, safety or health. Um, risks for either the individual themselves, their loved ones, or the, their neighbors. Um, and so if that is, if you can see that, um, if that's being demonstrated one way or another, then that might um, actually um, make it a bit of a requirement to, to, uh, to bring someone in, not necessarily to the home, but to have, uh, have, the seat, have the seat by a professional. That's a caveat that you don't see with other uh, diagnoses per se. Usually the, the way we make a diagnosis, as Dr. Richard mentioned earlier, is uh, the severity. Is it distressing and impairing to that individual? But oftentimes, as the question I think is suggesting, the individual with whom may not um, say, be saying that this is distressing or impairing. In fact, it's quite fine with me. Please leave me alone. Um, so we've got that caveat to make a diagnosis with hoarding, um, which is, is it causing essentially problems, health and safety risks to other people? Sure, so I, I mean, uh, so as long as I said, that's our limitation, but I, I guess just to be very clear about what she was getting at, then is that if there are health and safety risks, one of the tools we can sometimes bring to bear, very challenging to do, it's hard on the loved ones, it's hard on the individual recording, it's hard for us to be the heavies. A therapist would be to say, for example, well, even though they're denying it's a problem, the risk of fire is becoming really significant. There's piles and piles of papers on the stove and they're still cooking eggs in the morning. And they may end up causing a fire that results in deaths for themselves and others. So what what can be done sometimes is to involve people like the fire marshal's office and, and uh, our fire teams. And actually they are quite sensitive to hoarding and are increasingly becoming really informed. And so often we'll then try to work collaboratively with the team around that person to gradually reduce the risk. I mean, they'll put in place certain requirements that they have to get rid of some of the stuff, but they may do it rather gradually. It's not like they have to have a forced clean out the next day, but rather can we work with them the next month in getting those piles off the stove and then moving them away from the radiators and away from the sockets, for example, on the bottom, you know, the, the floor heaters. So uh, sometimes we can work with the authorities to try to put pressure to reduce those very real hazards the problems creating. Ultimately, having said that though, if there are no hazards that are a danger for those around them or themselves, then it's up to the individual to acknowledge it's a problem and to be willing to be treated. Nobody can force treatment on someone. Now you uh, mentioned earlier, and I'm just thinking it's related to this issue as well, and, and that is that your residential program has a strong family and so there's a strong family component in helping the person, and I'm not sure which one you mentioned it, but the families sometimes get incorporated into the rituals and, in a sense, enable the rituals. Is there a, the same kind of potential family involvement in hoarding, in, in uh, working and collaborating with the family to move the person forward and help the family to stop enabling? Um, I think yes, in theory. Um, and the thing that I wanted to add previously, I think, is, is addressing your question there. Um, there can be ways to uh, have somewhat, perhaps, difficult conversations with the person who's who hoards or is having too much stuff uh, to put boundaries around it. So, saying, you know, this is an area where I 
want to be in the home, um, and so can we kind of have this place clutter-free, for example, or this is an area where I'm feeling kind of unsafe, uh, and so can we please leave the clutter to this area? There, there can be, you know, difficult um, but perhaps calm conversations that you can try to have with a loved one to put some parameters around the issues. So I have a few questions now about, uh, and I've grouped them together because they're age-related questions. And this is, uh, a few, well, if you could, anyone who wants to answer, I think Lance is the one. Uh, at what age can people begin to practice mindfulness? Um, I can only speak to my own experience. I have two little guys so that are two and six. Um, my two-year-old, for sure, is being mindful but not in a formalized practice where um, everything is new and exciting to him, which is just awesome to see. But um, with uh, my other guy who's six, uh, there's a lot of practices out there that have been adapted readily for kids. Um, as you might imagine, like with all things, making it a bit more engaging, incorporating a bit more play into the experiences, trying to find ways to connect with other ideas. Um, there's even a yoga program that's out there where it's about uh, telling a story or you going on an adventure and they incorporate yoga posters into that. So there's a lot of really inventive ways for little people to be involved. Mindfulness for children, yeah. Mindfulness for children. Google mindfulness for children. There's a uh, sitting like a frog is also a really good one. So incorporating all kids like animals. So that sounds like a good one. Okay, so again, related to age, the um, residential program is for 18 to 65 year olds. What happens if someone is past the age of 65? Is residential treatment not effective? So, I mean, I think those are uh, general guidelines that we have. And uh, above the age of 65, we certainly judge on a case by case basis. Uh, part of the limitations come from just some of the practices of the regulated uh, health professionals in the program in terms of um, as one gets older, there could be uh, cognitive issues that start to come into play that may become disentangled with what the OCD looks like. Uh, so we would really need to tease that apart. As I also mentioned, the program itself is a lot of work. So at a certain age, it, it you know, fair enough, it might start to feel a bit too exhausting. Uh, there might be other kind of outpatient modifications that would be more appropriate. So that's why we have those kinds of general uh, guidelines in place. So another age-related question, uh, how do you balance the requirement for high doses of medications in OCD uh, with age and people who might have medical conditions or, for example, begin to fall? Really good question. So um, I guess I would start by saying in general, people are healthy and the evidence is very clear that these high doses are superior. It doesn't mean that everybody necessarily requires those high doses to get better. It's just that statistically they have the best odds of getting the best response because it takes so long to see if a drug will help you. You can imagine the frustration somebody might feel if they're taking a drug for two or three months and say, Doc, this isn't helping, only to have me say, well, why don't we go up one more pill and then try another two or three months, right? And the drug still may not help. So that's why we talk about it that way. Having said that, with age, people's ability to metabolize drugs in the liver does certainly decrease, more so in our 60s and beyond, less so before that. So certainly physicians can take that into account. However, for healthy adults, a good guide often is how well the drug is tolerated. The nice thing about the first line drugs is that they're very safe. In general, even taken at much higher doses than I recommended, most people won't get into safety issues. So even if you think about an older person in their 70s whose metabolism might be slower, it will be safe if they take a higher dose as well. If they have a lot of side effects though, that would be a good indication to me that maybe we're being a little too aggressive. And certainly I don't want my patients taking a medication on which they feel unwell. 
right? A common misconception is that I'm going to feel doped up by the drug or different. And in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Our goal in finding medication for the zones is finding a drug in which they feel absolutely 100% themselves, just better, right? And so that's our, our kind of target and we're monitoring for tolerability that way. There's specific kinds of conditions like liver disorders, kidney disorders, where we actually do have to adjust our dosage, but those are our special circumstances. Okay, while you're on a roll, on a roll Dr. Richter, is there a genetic component for hoarding or OCD? Oh, somebody knows what's near and dear to my heart. Um, I've only been looking for the genes for OCD and hoarding for 28 years. Am I getting there? You know, it's a good day. Um, no, there absolutely is a genetic basis to these conditions. That is now clearly indisputable. These conditions run in families. So, for example, if we look at risk, the risk in the general population, you might recall my saying, is about 42.5%. The risk for parents, siblings, or children of someone with OCD is closer to 12%. The risk to parents, siblings, or children of somebody whose OCD is fairly severe and started in childhood may be as high as 22%. Now, again, that certainly means a lot of people will not get it, but that speaks to the fact that there is genetic risk. Uh, in hoarding, it's not quite as high as that, but again, there are lots of studies at this point, well, a lot is an overstatement. There are a few studies that have looked at this that do show that hoarding does run in families as well. In terms of direct genetic causes, uh, there's some information on our website. I don't know if we brought those papers here, but if anybody emails, emails that's us, I'd be happy to send them a review. Uh, there are a number of genes that now seem to be linked to OCD beyond a doubt. The degree to which they contribute to the illness in an individual, though, is very, very small. So there is nothing that, as yet today in 2017, is helpful for genetic testing in terms of diagnosis. There is a hint of help from certain tests of the liver genes that break down these drugs for tolerability of drugs. And places like CAMH, for example, have been running a study for the last seven years, which is winding down now where people can get that liver testing a genetic testing of liver and brain genes done, but it's not yet widely available. I suspect that will be in the next year or two. So at this point, nothing specific, nothing you need to know. You can't, you can't go to your doctor and say, I want this blood test, but we're getting closer and it is giving us new insights into the causes of these illnesses. Okay, um, so this is a question about the intensive OCD program. What is the waiting list for the residential program? for day treatment, for IOP, and uh, if someone fails to respond, to, if someone uh, relapses afterwards, can they return for more therapy? So those are uh, good questions. Um, I can just say generally that we don't have a very specific wait time at this point. Um, we are ramping up to a full capacity of our 12 uh, client spots by the end of November, but I can't give a specific in terms of our wait times. Um, it's a little bit of a moving target right now. Uh, um, can someone return? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a really good question that I don't think we as a team have made a solid uh, decision on. You wouldn't want to undergo that kind of a treatment and, and come back right away, because that would probably feel like too much. You might want to figure out what it is that's getting in the way of being able to work on the OCD and maybe look at, at those behaviors and then potentially come back. So probably very individualized and certainly your treatment team, we monitor people very closely and we meet with people um, on a monthly basis to look at the progress that's being made, barriers to completing progress and kind of figuring out the best way to go. And also, we uh, are ramping up uh, offering an episode of care for people with severe OCD as outpatients through our program. So someone who's completed this may be eligible to continue seeing some of our clinicians that way. And so through that, we might be able to work with their outpatient community providers to also address those problems if they start out. So I, I have such great questions here, but we've virtually come to the end of this evening. I am going to ask you a couple of uh, final questions. 
And then uh, I don't know whether our um, panel is available. Uh, you may have to leave, but if they are available and they stick around, you may want to come and ask questions that you haven't asked, haven't had answered. I, I don't know which one. I, I, but let me ask you this question because it's kind of a fun question, but an important one. Um, and it's all about how to distinguish normal behavior from obsessive behavior. And the question is, um, well, that's a great question. That's not what I want to ask. Uh, I forget it, but it says, my, my sister has a shocking compulsion. Is that OCD? <laughs> Okay, so I don't want to be too long-winded because the answer is yes, it could be a form of OCD. Uh, compulsive shopping has been suggested to be a disorder in the cluster of OCD, as is compulsive internet use, for example, and a few other things. So they're not yet formally recognized uh, by our licensing agencies or those that determine diagnoses in North America, but it's one that's on the radar. I think the thing though to be aware of is that lots of us enjoy retail therapy, <laughs> right? You know, it's a very normal and common thing for a lot of us to say, I need a little bit of a lift today. I may go out and do a little shopping and make myself feel better. So not everybody who shops may be a little more than we might like to see has compulsive shopping disorder, but there are some individuals who will endure shopping so excessively that it's getting in the way of other activities, where the shopping is causing very significant debt or other problems for the family, and where they themselves are distressed by it. And so when we see that kind of a picture emerging, where it seems that that compulsive feel, it may be a disorder, and there is some suggestion that some of the forms of treatment we've talked about might be Okay, thank you. So uh, that concludes our evening. I have a couple of points to make before we thank our speakers. Firstly, uh, we've recognized the importance of learning from our patients. And so I call your attention to a weekly blog that is written by Paul Taylor. And uh, the blog provides advice to patients about navigating Canada's healthcare system. Uh, if you have questions, you can send them to askpaul at sunnybrook.ca. Be sure to hand in your evaluations. They're very important to us as we design and, and alter and change our presentations. Your feedback is very important. Uh, also, thank you very much to our groups who displayed outside. Um, and uh, as I said, our speakers may be available for a few minutes now. We want to come up and ask, ask questions. And check the Sunnybrook website for updates on what's going on at sunnybrook.www.sunnybrook.ca. And uh, finally, uh, please thank our remarkable presenters for this evening.